found myself in a close carriage with Madame Lande, with Mrs. Simpson, I should say, and driving at a great rate out of town in a direction northeast by north, half north. It had been determined to us, for us by Talbot, that as we were to be up all night, we, we should make our first stop at a village about 20 miles from the city and there get an early breakfast and some repose before proceeding upon our route. At four precisely, therefore, the carriage drew up at the door of the principal inn. I handed my adored wife out and ordered breakfast forthwith. In the meantime, we were all shown into a small parlor and sat down. It was now nearly, if not altogether, daylight, and as I gazed enraptured at the angel bus by my side, a singular idea came all at once into my head. That this really was really the very first moment since my acquaintance with the celebrated loveliness of Madame Lalande that I enjoyed a nearly ins a near inspection of that loveliness by daylight at all. And now, mon ami, she said she, taking my hand, so interrupting this trained reflection. And now, mon, mon cher ami, since we are indissolubly one, since I have yielded to your passionate entreaties and performed my portion of our agreement, I shall pres presume you have not forgotten that you have also a little favor to bestow, a little promise, which is your intention to keep. Ah, let me see. Let me remember. Yes. Full easily do I call to mind the precise words of the dear promise you made to Johnny last night. Listen, you spoke thus. It is done. It is most cheerfully agreed. I sacrifice every feeling for your sake. Tonight I wear this dear eyeglass as an eyeglass. And upon my heart, but with the earliest dawn of the, that morning, which gives me the privilege of calling you wife, I will place it upon my... upon my nose. For there ever afterward in the less romantic and less fashionable but certainly more serviceable form which you desire. These were these are words, my beloved husband, were they not? They were, I said. You have an excellent memory and assuredly my beautiful Eugene, there is no disposition on my part to evade the performance of my the trivial promise they imply. See, behold, they are becoming, rather, are they not? And here, having arranged the glasses in the ordinary form of spectacles, I applied them gingerly in their proper position while Madame Simpson, Simpson, adjusting her cap and folding her arms, sat bolt upright in her chair in a stiff Somewhat stiff and prim, and indeed in a somewhat undignified position. Goodness gracious me! I exclaimed, almost at the very instant that the rim of the spectacles had settled upon my nose. My goodness gracious me! Why, what can be the matter with these glasses? And taking them quickly off, I wiped them carefully with a sink handkerchief, silk handkerchief and adjusted them again, but if in the first instance they had, there had occurred something which occasioned me surprise, in the second the surprise became elevated into astonishment, and this astonishment was profound, was extreme, indeed I may say it was horrific. What in the name of everything hideous did this mean? Could I believe my eyes? Could I? That was the question. Was that... Was that... Was that Rouget? And were those... And were those... 
for those wrinkles upon the visage of Eugene Lalande, and oh, Jupiter and every one of the gods and goddesses, little and big, what, 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 what have become of her teeth? I dashed the spectacles violently to the ground and, leaping to my feet, stood erect in the middle of the floor, confronting Mrs. Simpson with my arms set akimbo and grinning and foaming, but at the same time utterly speechless and with terror and with rage. Now, I've already said the, that Madame well, Eugene Lalande, that is to say, Simpson, spoke the English language but very little better than she wrote it. And for this reason, she very properly never attempted to speak it upon ordinary occasions. But rage will carry a lady to an extreme. And in the present case, it carried Mrs. Simpson to the very extraordinary extreme of attempting to hold a conversation with a tongue that she not, did not altogether understand. Well, monsieur said she, after surveying me in great apparent astonishment for some moments. Well, monsieur, and what then? What the matter now? Is it the dance of the Saint Vistus that you have? If not like me, but for... For by and... De pig and de poke? You wretch, said I, catching my breath. You, you, you villainous old hag. Hag? Oh, me not so very old. After all, me not one single day more than the eighty two. Eighty two! I ejaculated, staggering to the wall. Eighty-two hundred thousand baboons. The miniature said twenty-seven years and seven months. To be sure, that is so very true. But then the portrait has been taken for these fifty-five years. Then I go marry my second husband. Monsieur Lavande, at the time I had the portrait taken from my daughter by my first husband, Monsieur M Mozart. Mozart? Yes, Mozart, she said, mimicking my pronunciation. Wishes to speak the truth was none the best. And what then? What you know about the Mozart? Nothing, you old fright. I know nothing about him at all. Only I had an ancestor of that name once upon a time. That name. And what you have to first say to that name? Tis very good name. And so is Vossart. That is very good name too. My daughter, Mon Mademoiselle Moisart, she married von Monsieur Moisart. And the name is very, both very respectable name. Moisart? I exclaimed, and Wazart? Why, what is it you mean? What I mean? I mean Wazart and Wazart, and for the matter of that, I mean Quazart and Frazart, too. If only I think proper to mean it. My daughter's daughter, Mademoiselle Wazart, she married von Monsieur Quazart, and then again, my daughter's granddaughter. Mademoiselle Quasart, she married von Monsieur Quasart, and I suppose you say that that is not von very respectable name. Quasart, I began, said I began to faint. Why, surely you don't mean, you don't say Mozart and Quasart and Quasart and Frazart? Yes, she replied, leaning fully back in her chair and stretching out her lower limbs at great length. Yes, Mozart and Fozart and Quasar and Fozart, but Monsieur Fozart, he was was one very big what you call fool. He was one very big dunce like yourself. For he left La Belle France for come to this stupid Amerique.
and then he get here, he went have one very stupid and very, very stupid sound. So I hear, though I not yet have had the pleasure to meet with him, neither me nor my companion, the Madame Stephanie Lalande, he is named the Napoleon Bonaparte Foisart. And I just posted that that too is not one very respectable name. Either the length of the, or nature of the speech has had the effort to effect of working up Mrs. Simpson into a very ordin extraordinary passion indeed. And as she made an end of it, with great labor, she jumped up from her chair like somebody bewitched, dropping upon the floor an entire universe of bustle as she jumped. Once upon her feet, she gnashed her gums, brandished her arms, rolled up her sleeves, shook her fist in my face, and concluded the performance by tearing the cap from her head, and with it an immense wig of the most valuable and beautiful black hair, and the whole of which she dashed upon the ground with a yell, and there trampled and danced a fandango upon it, in an absolute ecstasy and agony of rage. Meantime, I sank aghast in my chair, which she had vacated. Mozart and Foisart, I repeated thoughtfully, as she cut one of her pigeon wigs, and Quasart and Foisart, as she completed another. Mozart and Foisart and Quasart and Napoleon Bonaparte a Foisart. Why, you ineffable old serpent, that's me! That's me, they hear? That's me! Here I cry, scream at the top of my voice, That's me, I am Napoleon Bonaparte Foisart, and if I have not married my great-great-grandmother, I wish I may be everlastingly confounded. Madame Eugène Lalande, quasi Simpson, formerly Mozart, was, in sober fact, my great great grandmother. In her youth, she had been beautiful, and even at 82, <laughs> retained the majestic height of her, the sculpture contour of head, the fine eyes of the Grecian nose of her girlhood. By the aid of these, of the pearl powder of rouge, of false hair, false teeth, and false. Corner, as well as of the most skillful modices of Paris. She contrived to hold a respectable footing in, among the beauties of Ampou Passes of the French metropolis. In this respect, indeed, she might have been regarded as little less than equal of the celebrated Ninon de l'Enclosé. She was immensely wealthy, and being left for the second time a widow without children, she bethought herself of my assistance in America, and for the purpose of making me her heir, paid a visit to the United States. In company with a distant and exceedingly lovely relative of her second husband's, a Madame Stephanie Lalande. At the opera, my great-great-grandmother's -grand attention was arrested by my notice, and upon surveying me through her eyeglass, she was struck with a certain family resemblance to herself. Thus interested, she noted that the heir she sought was actually in the city. She made inquiries of the party respecting me. The gentleman who attended her knew my person and told her who I was. The information thus obtained induced her to renew her scrutiny, and this scrutiny it was which so emboldened me that I behaved in a certain manner already detailed. She returned her my bow, however, under the impression that, by some odd accident, I had discovered her identity, when deceived by my weakness of vision into the arts of the toilet, in respect to in the age and charms of the old strange lady, I demanded so enthusiastically of Talbot who she was, he concluded that I meant the younger beauty, as a matter of course, and so informed me with perfect truth that she was, quote, the celebrated widow Madame Lalande, unquote. 